Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. My name's Andy. This is video 49. This is the last lecture in the series, uh, or at least the last module. Um, it's on FFI, Foreign Function Interfaces. Um, after this lecture, there'll be some uh, exercises, uh, and then we'll be done with this series. I'm really interested in what you would like me to cover next. Um, I'm really loving doing Rust stuff, um, wondering about a few ideas about that. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today... Um, we're going to learn how we can use C code from Rust um, and potentially also use Rust code from C. Um, um, so we're going to talk a bit about what the C representation is, the C calling convention, uh, what cargo bind gen is, uh, and how you can make nice APIs around C libraries. <laughs> and we're going to briefly mention uh, how you can uh, do Python, write Rust code that can be used from within Python as well. Uh, and this, we'll get into this stuff more in the exercises. Okay, so this is what we're going to be covering. So first of all, why would you want to have different languages be able to talk to each other? Well, big reason is there's existing code written in those other languages. Uh, so you, at this point, you get an ecosystem for free. There's all kinds of C code out there. And in fact, other code that conforms to the C calling convention um, that we might well want to use from Rust instead of writing it all ourselves. Uh, also, uh, the language we're using might have abilities that we don't have in this language. Um, uh, so you need to call into it to get that stuff. Um, here's some examples um, of very tight coupling between uh, languages. So languages on the Java virtual machine, like Java, Scala, and Kotlin, they can call each other uh, in a very flexible way because they're, in a way, they're almost like the same language with just different syntax. Um, similar with stuff in the um, in the C sharp ecosystem, um, some of those languages compile to something that it, that behind the scenes is really the same thing. So they can call each other very naturally and very tightly coupled. Um, similarly, on in the Erlang ecosystem, on the Beam VM, Erlang and Elixir can um, talk to each other very natively. Um, and also, some of these um, languages that work at the kind of uh, C calling convention level, uh, like Zig, D, and Nim, uh, they can certainly they can use C code almost as if it's um, native code to them. Um, and the compiler does a lot of checking for them. Um, and uh, it's not quite that tightly integrated when you use C code from Rust. And there are good reasons for that. It's not just that the Rust people think that they're better than C or something. Um, basically, uh, the, the restrictions that Rust provides, very deliberately provides, don't apply in C. So you can't just naturally call between one and the other as if they were the same thing. Um, so as it says here, uh, idiomatic C is just not the same as idiomatic Rust. It doesn't work the same way. Uh, you don't get the guarantees from C code that Rust depends on. Uh, you know, Rust code will just happily crash away if it's using C code uh, that doesn't um, follow its uh, conventions unless you, uh, you know, take care with it. Um, and yeah, if we were going to do something more tightly integrated, effectively the Rust compiler would have to be a C compiler as well, um, or a Zig compiler or whatever other language you wanted to integrate with. So instead of that, what we do is we um, we wrap the the C code that we're using in Rust expressions, uh, or we wrap the Rust code that we're doing and we compile it into uh, object code that can then be used by C. And then we get the linker, um, which takes the object files and turns them into a program to stitch things together. Um, what this does mean, by the way, is that whenever you call a C function from Rust, it uh, is unsafe, and you need to explain why it's okay that you're calling it in that way. So yeah, basically, what we're saying is that um, we just talk through the C um, calling convention. Um, we we act when we're calling when we're using C code. We act as if we ourselves are C, and when we're getting C code to call us, um, we compile our code so that it looks from the outside like it's C. And when I'm saying C, by the way, I'm including uh, C++ and other things in the kind of native uh, um, ecosystem. 
Um, the C calling convention is what we call it because it was kind of invented for C. And it's just a standard way of building your object files so that they, um, uh, you know what a function looks like and stuff like that. We'll get slightly more into it. So yeah, Rust and C disagree on um, how to call things and how to lay out their memory. Um, so um, what we do is if we have a C function that we want to call, um, which is called my C function, but we want to call it from within Rust, instead of, def normally when we're going to call a function in Rust, we define the function in Rust, right? And then we call it. Instead of doing that, what we do is we declare that it exists and then and that it's going to get linked in later. And when we're doing the exercises, we'll see how this actual linking process works. But um, just imagine that we've got some C code somewhere and we know that there's a function called my C function. Well, what we do is we put this extern C block and then we just declare the function. So there's no body here. We're just saying this function exists. And the arguments that it takes are an i32 and a bool. And you can't just put any old arguments in here. A lot of these arguments won't work. But i32s and bools are something that makes sense in a C world as well as in a Rust world. They have different names there, but they, um, conceptually, we know how to, we know what, we know what C code that takes those types looks like. So the linker will then, so now we can, in the rest of our Rust code, we can now call this function as if it exists. And we know that it will, um, it, once the link has done its job, it will exist. And that's so we'll be able to actually call. Um, so here is how you call it. You have to make an unsafe block, as I said, because we don't know what this C function is doing. Maybe it's going to like completely trash our memory or, um, you know, delete something that we, we were pointing out or something like that. So in order to use it, we need to have an unsafe block that basically is saying, yes, I have thought about what this C function does with memory and stuff, and it's not going to break me. And probably, hopefully, like a little safety comment in there explaining why it's safe to call that C function. In this case, since we're just passing ownership of that 42 in and not getting anything out, it feels very safe um, that unless that C function does some crazy stuff underneath um, and trashes everything, uh, that it would be safe to call that function. And you can see here the um, the assembly language that's getting created. Uh, essentially, the argument, this 42 argument, gets put into um, a register, and then we call the function. And this is what that looks like in assembly language. Um, and then we do some other tidying up. So um, it's very low level what's happening, right? It, it just calls into that function, which is why it's unsafe, right? Because it, like, like the Rust code that you use is also going to get compiled into stuff that looks like this. But it's we know, because the Rust compiler has checked it, that it's still going to follow all the rules that we have in Rust. Whereas, when we're calling into the C function, we have no idea what it's going to do underneath. No, the Rust compiler has not checked that C function. All right. So um, here is just a, a way of thinking about calling conventions. Right. So let's imagine we have a Rust, we have a bit of Rust code, uh, which, with a method called foo, uh, which takes in a vector, takes ownership of that vector, and calls len on it, uh, and just returns how long that vector is. So basically, consumes the vector, returns how long it is. So this this main function is going to, you know, just calculate the number zero because that vector is zero length, and then do nothing with it. But yeah, just a function takes in a vector, returns a uh, u size. There's two ways of thinking about how we would structure that code as a as a c like function um uh, uh, at a lower level which basically can only pass in pointers and numbers and things like that um and there's probably other ways but here are two ways of thinking about it so um when we're generating our assembly language for uh or run well when we're generating um, code that looks like C, even though this is like Rust syntax, this is code that looks like C. Um, there's two ways. You either pass in a pointer to the beginning of the vector and a length of that vector and the capacity of that vector, because those are the three important facts about a vector. What a vector really is, is a pointer to some data, how long that data is, and what the kind of maximum amount of data we can fit in there before we have to change this pointer to point at some other bit of memory is. So you can either make it three arguments, 
Or you can make it one argument, which is a pointer, which itself points at these three numbers, which are st stored somewhere else. This u size here is, is going to actually hold a pointer. Um, and either way, we like then the implementation is slightly different, right? Here we just we've been given the answer. In this case, the implementation of foo is very straightforward. We've already been given the answer, which is this len. So we can just return it. Uh, in this case, we have to go look up uh, this vector, find len inside it, which is the, the second thing in here. So dot one. So anyway, the implementations are not so important. The important thing is there are two ways of representing this um, this function, uh, and someone who's calling it will either have to pass in three arguments by pushing them into three registers, uh, or just pass in one argument, which is a pointer to the the thing, which um, in some sense is the vector, which is these three numbers. Um, so there's different ways of of calling functions and um, both of them are reasonable in different circumstances. So we don't know necessarily which one is being used. In fact, a different version of the Rust compiler or something like that might change its mind about how it, it represents a function like that. And it might be that like up to 10 arguments, we do it one way. And then when there are more than 10 arguments, we do it another way, something like that. So this is the kind of uncertainty that you have when you generate machine code from um, Rust code. And Rust doesn't make any guarantees about what shape that um, machine code is going to take uh, for, in, in terms of this kind of thing. Um, but the C calling convention does. So basically, um, when you compile C, different in C++, by the way, and possibly other things, but when you when you um, compile C, it has a specific layout. It um, It's known what calling convention is going to be used um, in each case. So if we want our Rust code to have a layout that's predictable in the same way, we put an extern C uh, on the function to say, I want you to use not not the kind of unpredictable calling convention that we might choose in five years' time for Rust, but this very predictable known calling convention which C uses. Um, and the C calling convention is the only thing that I know of that multiple languages use to talk to each other because C, C's calling convention is really well established and well understood. Um, also, um, on this first point, yeah, like it's a kind of the kind of a similar point, but basically, um, calling C, you're almost always passing in a pointer to something, and in Rust, you might not be. Um, yeah, so in order to interoperate with other languages, including C, we use the C calling convention, and the way we use the C calling convention is we um, we put this extern C. Oh, it's not actually here. Is there an example of this later? I feel like there is. Um, yeah, so uh, here's our example. We'll get to this in a minute, but here's our example. When, we, when we're when defining a function and we want it to be um, callable from C, we have this extern C before it. Um, all right, so back to where we were. Um, okay, so um, now I mentioned earlier some types are okay to pass in um, into f external C functions. So these functions are things that are defined in C, but then we're... Um, we're declaring them here to say I want to use them. And I said only some types can be used. So, for example, I32 is fine to use. All is fine to use. Uh, and also pointers are fine to use because they're kind of well understood and they're, they're a concept that's used in C uh, with the same meaning. Um, and there are also some types of enum that we can use. If we do this repra u8, and then we have an, a very simple enum. By the way, just to avoid confusion, because I got confused when I read this, this is not a color which is defined by like 100 red plus 50 green plus 1 blue or something like that. This is literally just, is this color red or green or blue, right? So this can be, this whole, uh, a value of this whole enum can be represented in one U8. In fact, there's only, you know, it's only going to use 0, 1 or 2 or something like that. Um, so if we say represent this as a U8, and these enum values don't have any values, and these variants don't have any values inside them, they are tag only, then this enum is also okay to use in an extern C context. So you can pass this color in and you can return a color and it, 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 you know it will actually get turned into a U8. So it'll be just a byte being passed in and a byte being returned. And that's obviously fine. Uh, C functions can take in bytes and return bytes as well. Okay. But then um, there are others which are more complicated, um, but they are still allowed. So for example, uh, this point thing, 
uh, which is uh, both an, an, which is two F32s, X and Y. Um, if we say reprocede before it, then we, we're basically saying, please make it ready and allowed to be used in an extern C function. And now, um, they, because we said reprocede, that means this struct itself is going to be represented in memory as a shape which fits with the C calling convention. And I presume what that will be is that this will get translated into um, some kind of pointer to that point. Um, wait, and the point itself will be just two F32s next to each other in memory, I'm guessing. Um, also, if you have a wrapper type like this, which is just, is in this case, it just holds onto a T, doesn't do anything else. If you say repro transparent, uh, when you're talking to C code, it will just see that as a T. It won't, it won't even notice that that wrapper exists because all that wrapper is doing is giving you some methods and things you can call on it. Those things aren't going to get called while you're in the C. So the C is fine to say, okay, you've given me a wrapper U64. I'm just going to actually, that's just going to be a function, uh, which is just a U, takes just a U64. Um, yeah, but only if it's, only if the inner type is repro C. So like this point or U64 is already repro C. Um, basically, like, repressy means like we know how it's going to look when we translate it into this C world. Okay. Um, another example, uh, unions are also okay to be repressy. Um, because a union is a, is a thing that C knows about. So, um, a part of the reason why unions exist is because they make sense in C, because in C, well, maybe they don't make sense, but they, uh, in C, it's kind of, it's normal for you to have to keep track of, is this an int or a float or whatever? Uh, you know, is it, is it this variant or that variant? Um, whereas in Rust, we'll normally use an enum, which does all that bookkeeping for us. Uh, and a union is something that we have to be responsible for knowing which one it is. See, that's the normal thing for C. So a union makes sense to translate into that C world. Okay. But there's a lot of types that don't work. So enums that have, Variants that contain stuff like result or option and also things which are, um, which own memory and might, um, reallocate when they get used, like string or vec, um, don't work. And also things that aren't just pointers, but are actually so-called fat pointers, like slices. So ampersand str or ampersand square bracket t square bracket, um, are they look like references because they've got an ampersand there. I mean, they are references, but the underlying representation of that reference for a str, for example, is not just a pointer to a bit of memory, which contains those characters. It's also a length. Um, so those can't be represented explicitly in C because it's like two values. Um, and you wouldn't want to just be the, just skip past in the pointer. Um, so they need to be, you need to handle them yourself. Like decide what kind of like pointers you're going to pass into the C if you're using C code. Um, we saw a bit of an example of that in one of our recent exercises where we, we created a C string, which is a, a load of characters with a zero at the end. And then we passed a pointer to that C string in to, uh, exec V, the function, C function. Um, and in that case, it's okay to just pass in a pointer because the whole point of having that null on the end of those characters is that you don't need to say the length because you can find it by just searching through to find that null. Anyway, um, yeah, so some of these types just don't work in C and you need to do your own work. Okay, so let's talk a bit about cargo bind gen. So what cargo bind gen does is generates Rust code using C header files. So if you've got some C code, um, that does some useful work for you, and you want to call that C code from Rust, you may well want to use cargo bind gen. And what cargo bind gen does is looks through the header files of those, um, of that C code, uh, checks what functions exist, what arguments they take, and so on, and then it creates Rust code that looks like this, uh, which is maybe pretty ugly looking, but it's got the information you need so that you can call that, uh, code from Rust. So it's basically saying, uh, like this function exists and it takes these arguments. And a lot, oftentimes these arguments will be like uh, pointers to some kind of uh, type, which is like, um, like it, like a weird looking type because it's like the underlying um, types that the C code is using. Uh, sometimes just like say a C int or something like that. Um, and now you can call these functions from Rust 
Um, it's still not going to be easy because you've still got to figure out what type of pointer is it and what rules does, does that pointer need to follow? Like, for example, am I handing over ownership of this thing to, um, to the C function or am I, and am I taking ownership of some pointer that comes back? Uh, things like that. But at least you can, this is how you can call that C code without manually reading all the C header files and figuring out what the types are. So cargo bunch, I'm very useful for that. All right. So, um, it, it, like C and Rust interaction is not just straightforward. You, you can't just call a C function because you happen to know it exists. You've got to tell Rust the name and the types. Uh, you can use, um, bind gen for that. Um, uh, you can also, if you want to call Rust code from C, you need to force Rust to use the C calling convention. Um, or in fact, or in either direction, you need to, whenever there's an interaction, it needs to be via the C calling convention. And you can only use types that have a C compatible representation. And yeah, um, cargo bind gen will automate some of that, make it easier for you to, or just do the donkey work so that you can think about how to actually use this stuff. Um, also using Rust from C. So if we want to write a Rust function and then it gets used from some other code, which uses the C calling convention, for example, some C or C++ code, and actually, for example, some Python code, um, then you can write your function. Again, you're going to need to use types that uh, make sense for that C calling convention. You write this extern C before the name of it, um, and you put this uh, no mangle declaration, and that means the name of this is going to come out as actually sum and not some other uh, name that's somehow been namespaced and uh, stuff by um, the way Rust thinks about names. It's just going to be literally called sum. So when you're writing your C code, you can just call a function sum and, and trust it's going to be there so long as you've linked in this, this compiled Rust. And then it can do some work. No, you can notice you can do all kinds of clever Rusty stuff in there because all, all that gets translated into machine code, which is perfectly callable from C as much as it is from Rust. Um, but yeah, the other note here worth knowing is that once you've written your Rust code like this, you also need to change some stuff in your cargo.toml to compile it into a library that can then get linked into C code. Um, also, and we'll look at what this more in the exercises. So this is really just a little hint for you, but, um, one of the really nice ways of using Rust is to speed up some of your Python code. If you're writing most of your code in Python or the high level code in Python, but you've got something that's slow, um, then you can um, write just that bit in Rust and then call it from Python. And uh, the way they're recommending to do this here is to use the py03 uh, crate, uh, bring in this stuff, and then you annotate your function by saying this is a Python function. I guess this is like a function that can be called from Python. I guess that means uh, you can use normal types here and then it can return a pi result. Um, so Python does all kinds of reference counting and stuff um, on its uh, values. So you sometimes have to be careful with um, uh the uh, the types here, but in this case, this is just a straightforward Rust function uh, returns a string, and this pi result just means like it's like result. I'm guessing um, with this OK variant, um, and then so that's that's how you make the function itself, and it just returns a normal string, and that will some at some point when you call it from Python, it will get converted into a Python string, which is very different. Um, but in order to actually make this stuff available within Python, you also need to define a Py module, which takes in some, uh, it takes in this M argument, which is a Py module, turns a Py result, but critically you have to call m.add function and then use, pass it your function, but wrap it using this wrapper. No idea what any of this does, but what it means is that now once you've started Python and you've basically, you've told it where you're, your new compiled module is in all kinds of clever ways, which hopefully we'll get into in the exercises. You can just say import name of module, and then from in that module, you can call this function. It works and it, it's, imagine it's done a load of clever work inside here. Um, this will be running in like fast machine code. The result will come out as the type that you said, which is weirdly in this case, a string, but that's just to demonstrate, I guess. All right. So that is all we have to say 
about Rust 101. That was all the lectures from this excellent um, series made by Tweedy Golf. Please check out Tweedy Golf on the internet. They're doing all kinds of cool stuff. Um, thanks to them for making these slides. Um, I hope you enjoyed the stuff. Um, I, I hope that you leave comments um, about things that we could do next, things you enjoyed, things that you would change. Um, we, which is not the end of the series because we have um, several exercises for this section still coming up. Once we've done those exercises, um, I don't know whether I'll be taking a break or moving on to something else. At some point, I'll definitely be moving on to something else. Um, but in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed it. Have a go at the exercises. There are links in the um, show notes. And uh, we'll get on to uh, doing them um, in a video soon. See you then.